Well, listen, hello everyone. Welcome this morning to Straight Talk Live. And I'm so excited today because we have such a special program with all of our other panelists. Our program is called Straight Talk because we are gospel-centered. We're looking at all the issues that face us in the world today, but we're looking at it from a biblical worldview. And so we labor to bring all of our thoughts, all of our words into concert with what God's word says. And we're so grateful to this season for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If he had not been raised from the dead, this program would be in vain. And uh, also, uh, we have such a diverse panel. Some are not here with us today uh, for other reasons, uh, but we're trying to reflect to the body and to our world that we can be of different ethnicities, different genders, both genders, and still the love of God brings us all in concert together because God is love. So before I go to our special, special, special guest today, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dennis to uh, say hello to the rest of the folks. Thank you, Van, and welcome to our program today. Uh, we look forward to our session today with uh, Dr. Clark and to the rest of our panel who is one today. And we thank the Lord for this particular Friday. Welcome all of you on Facebook uh, with us today and those who will be watching us on YouTube and on our podcast on Anchor. And so we hope that you enjoy the program today. It's been a, a diverse group of subjects that we've been covering and you can cover and look at us and, and be a part of all of what we're doing throughout. So thank the Lord for all of our, our panel who are on and our special guests. And Van is gonna introduce our guests and we'll get back into uh, what we're going to talk about for today. All right. Well, you know, as you can see, <clears throat> everybody here is a doctor, a professor. I mean, just a room full of erudites. I mean, it's just amazing. These ivory tower ruminators. But the wonderful thing that I like about our panel is that everybody here loves the Lord and we love each other. And uh, we are filled with the spirit of God that empowers us to live the way we ought to live and think the way we ought to think. But today we have a very special guest. Um, I told you in the past that I was a part of a, the Alliance for Black Pentecostal Scholarship. And today we have the president of the Alliance with us today uh, that I met through uh, Lois at the SPS meeting and uh, met with Dr. Clark. And uh, I say this morning, good morning to you, Dr. Clark. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, panel. Yes. So before uh, we uh, delve into the subject we, uh, from our panel, and uh, I'm going to read a little bit of his bio, but uh, uh, I, it, I'm going to read a, an abridged version because it's so long that you would think that I'm guilty of uh, exaggerated felicitations, but I'm not. He really <laughs> has accomplished these things. So anyhow, uh, it reads, Dr. Clark was born and raised in the United Kingdom, he gained his bachelor's degree from the University of Nottingham in the UK, his master's degree, religious studies from the University of Derby, UK, and his PhD in theology from the University of Birmingham in 2003. Uh, and Dr. Clark is involved in three areas. He's a pastor, he's a professor, and he is a missionary. Um, and this is important for us to understand, too. He also has a lovely, lovely, brilliant wife that makes him look better than he ever could by himself, <laughs> uh, Marcia Clark. And they have been multi-church planters um, in Virginia and several other places. They have a couple of sons, two sons, I believe, also. Well, one son, one daughter. One son and one daughter. Okay. Yeah. Right. So She'll kill me if I don't. Bio. Stick straight. to the bio. <laughs> Stick to the bio. He's been a professor and teacher, and he still is uh, teaching for every time he opens his mouth. Uh, so we see that he's worked with the, he helped establish the Pan-African Christian University in Accra, Ghana, a place that I've been. It's a beautiful place. Um, also, he was uh, appointed professor of intercultural studies at Regent University in Virginia as well. 
and he has been the assistant provost and professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's written six books, and one of the great things that I love about him is that he is very missions-minded, very missions-minded, and has his own global empowerment uh, network. network. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Dr. Clark and I have been on Zoom many times together, and I've been with him, and we've been talking, and I'm so excited. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking because you have most recently written a book. And and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start it out this way, Dr. Clark. You can... Uh, anything about yourself you want us to know, but in, in particular about your book. And remember, uh, Bishop Sterling Lands is listening to you at the same time, but <laughs> I I'm going to uh, start out with one basic question. In the words of that great uh, poet, singer, scholar, Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, love has everything to do with it. And, um, and, you know, I, I quote in the book that I quote a lot about Martin Luther King because love, love and struggle must go together. Yeah. Love gives meaning to struggle. Hmm. Love gives intimate, it, it gives impetus and longevity and, and staying power to struggle because you have to know what you're struggling for. You can't struggle long with hate. Mm -hmm. And you certainly cannot um, acquire meaning and, and be godly in terms of your orientation until, unless you understand love. And so sometimes it's easy in the midst of the struggle that we become politicized or we become, even in our own way, kind of a, a kind of a, a struggle which is ethnocentric focus and, and we lose sight of the Christ, Christocentric underpinning that is really the substratum of what we are trying to achieve. Um, and, and so, and that's why I, I wrote the book because I was losing my way. Mm. I, I was getting into the flesh. I, I, I was becoming militant in the wrong militant but not in the spirit i need somebody to say amen <laughs> and i need to go back to uh and this is the, and, and this book is is not meant to be and that's why we talked about um and dr rod about about bonhoeffer um because uh, it, it's important that we embed our discipleship and we are not co-opted, politicized by other agendas, motivation. Um, and unless you are deeply Christological, you can easily be, allow your, your theologies to be a political theology, a, a theology that really lacks a deep imbibe biblical ethos and, and 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 i think this book well it's, it's actually my own theological reflection i wasn't attempting to to be highly theological i wasn't attempting to be erudite or to give a kind of a a a political um strategy to overcoming racism this book was a personal theological reflection to, to try to do a deep dive and understand what is at the base, what is the, the idea that we need to grab hold of, the missio day aspect of what we're talking about, um, and then working our way up. And at the bottom, at the deep dive, at the bottom, I see a man hanging on the cross. And the Bible says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And I said, this is the place where we start. Mm -hmm. Love. Love is the starting point. 
And, and I really began by, um, my journey began by looking at the apostle of love, um, John, the great apostle, one of the last of the apostles to, to die. And, and I love the fact that John, and I can see him as an old man, a, 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 a battle survival beaten warrior being helped into the the room as i talk about and the scribes and the the onlookers are at awe of this man who had been with with jesus he had been a part of the inner circle and he's one of the last to live and he's speaking and his words are few but the words that he wants to make clear is that God is love. Mm, mm, and, and you know, it's a funny thing that particularly evangelicals, we, are, we use love as a panacea. A love is a go-to place when there's tension. And we've misrepresented what love is all about. We think love is this kumbaya moment. We, we think love is this, this erasure of difference. We talk about love as, as some soft, you know, mushy idea, but love is brutal. Love is bloody. Love is, is strong. It, it, it's unrelenting, you know, and, um, and that's the kind of love that we want to talk about, you know. Mm. Uh, and so that, that was the main thing, a kind of a theological reflection of what is the vision of God in terms of what did God have in mind when he created diversity? Mm. What, was, what, did, what, is, what is the tool that God has given us to get through this historical mess? What is the, what is the end goal? Uh, and what do we use to survive? What is it? And, and because we're not clear on this, we allow ourselves to become co-opted into all kinds of agenda which is why the evangelicals lost their way in this. Uh, they were co-opted into an agenda that was not biblical, was, that was not, was, was not um, Christological. It was political. And, and we can all do this. We, we can do this, whether you're evangelical, whether you're a person who is a, a black radical, whether you are a proponent of black theology or, or feminist theology or whatever, we can easily become um, driven by our, our theological and political impetus and, and passions um, without this deep imbibing of how, how does it connect with Christ's mission. And so that's pretty much... Um, I was doing a, 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 a series, I, and the thing about my situation is that my ch the church I pastor is 60% Caucasian. God has a sense of humor. I mean, I, I moved from becoming a, the, um, the professor for black church studies to being a multicultural pastor. Uh, and, and someone who lived in Africa for a long time, passed an African-American church, and God thought this would be good for my theology to try to uh, to speak in a way that you don't lose people. It's easy to speak as a white evangelical to the masses who support you, support your understanding. It's easy to speak to a black church in a way that you don't have to be sensitive to people who love you, people who care for you, and people who, who you love and deeply serve but they don't look like you. How, how are you to navigate a theology that is deeply committed to justice, but at the same time, we bring people with us? And the way to do this, rather than moving to left and these, these dichotomies of left and right and in between, how do, how do, how do we move in a way that is, that is Christian? And what is a Christian theology of reconciliation i think we need to get back to that so that that was my motivation my own struggle and i'm still struggling
You have to unmute yourself, man. On this program, thank you, that uh, we are all struggling. Welcome to the struggle. And uh, I think we're involved in a struggle. I think we talk on this program about the difference between piety and protest and uh, how it is easy for the human nature to get off balanced in our piety and as well as in our protest, that there's a place for both, uh, kind of an equipoise that we need to flow in the realm of both. But also, uh, and then I'll open the uh, uh, discussion to anyone that wants to jump in with you, Dr. Clark. Also, uh, you know, coming from my background, would you give me a better understanding of, in this struggle? How, how is one to define love? What is the biblical perspective on the definition of love itself that we should be imbibed with and flowing out of us to bring reconciliation into this world? Yes, and um, and that's something that I um, I talk about the the looking at what love is, um, and you know it's interesting because I've lived in I've born and raised in the UK, and also spent ten years living in in West Africa and, and traveling widely throughout Africa and really getting to know a different worldview. And for the past 10 years, I've been living in the US. Um, and it's interesting in terms of how do we bring together difference? I worked in England and I've seen struggle between immigrant communities from the Caribbean, from India, from Pakistan and Bangladesh. As we, And this is a very recent struggle now. This is something that really since the 1950s, we've seen other black people have been a part of the British Empire and even in the UK since the Roman times um, when Adrian was building the Roman walls there was a number of, of, it, uh, of, of, of African soldiers that were in Britain but very small amount and so looking at what again I'm going to get to your question but looking at what what does love look like in a British sense when you are seeing a, a, a an, when you are up against empire in a strong sense when you're up against a a, a colonized and, and a colonizing mindset uh, and again what does love look like when you are when i was in sierra leone um during the blood clash there and, and seeing um government troops and rebel troops uh, and seeing people being amputated and butchered, um, and also going to to Nigeria and seeing what what's happening there, in terms of even when we think about the Biafra War in Nigeria, when when a million people got killed, the Ibos and and Yodabas fighting against each other, and you're looking, what does love look like in those situations? And even in America, when you have this long legacy, this dilemma of race. In, in in America, what does love look like? And you know, this is a time when we need to go back to the scriptures. And what, what my reading has taught me is that, um, and I use two words there, I talk about the chesed love, which I looked into very carefully. We often talk about agape, philias, and, and so on and so forth, the Greek understanding, but I really looked at the Hebrew, which I love it, the chesed that we read about, is, is a love that moves in one way. <laughs> it's a love that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't change the way I feel. That's deep. I was, I was going to say, like my American friend, that's deep, y'all. <laughs> because it's saying that, I mean, this is really something special, that my actions, what I do, is nothing to do with the, what you do in terms of the way I feel. And so I can resist you at the same time. I can love you. Mm -hmm. I can, I can be, I can resist a white racist. I can resist a white supremacist. I can resist someone, but at the same time, I can love them because I resist you because you are being used by the devil. But I loved you. I loved you because you've been created by God, yeah, in God's image. And and, and holding these two things together mm -hmm. makes me not move to 
annihilate you. That in my struggle to resist, I'm resisting who you are because I'm struggling to get you to where you need to be mm. and where we all need to be. And, and so when I'm thinking about the Hesed love here, it's, and I have to be very careful because Elaine's here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Elaine's, I'm sure she's an Old Testament scholar, but, um, or biblical, a biblicist anyway. So, so let, let me slow down. <laughs> but anyway, um, what my reading has taught me is, is that the, you know, the love that Jesus, that, that God gives, and it's interesting when God said he loves us with an everlasting love. Um, it's a love that, uh, I, and it's interesting, was it Ozea when, when God told the prophet to take a, a harlot? He said, I want you to love and understand what it means to love one way. And though, even though when you go out and the people are sneering because they had been with your, with your wife the day before, I want that not to affect the way you move, the way you treat her. And, and God is teaching us that. And let me tell you, you can't do this without God. Mm-hmm. You, can't, you cannot do this unless God puts something in you. You can't resist and love at the same time. You can resist evil and not allow. You see, it's, it's the fact that God is in me and God is working through my life through the chesed love, that, that, that makes me in, in some way not to take on the hate and become bitter and become like those we, we abhor. It, it's, and it, it's that dichotomy. And so what, what, I, what I learned here is, you know, love is often, love is a verb. Love is not just an adjective. It's, a, it, it's what we do. Um, and, and this is something which the, the black prophetic tradition has taught us. It, it has taught us that, and that, that something in, in which when you think about white supremacists and people who are, who are feeling um, uh, hate, um, now they're feeling something here because there, there's a shift in the country. But, but what, they, what they don't have to bring a balance is this sense of biblical love. It, it, and in the black prophetic tradition, we are able, because we, 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 are, we, we are people of faith, people of a very rich tradition, um, drawing on the spirituals, drawing on, you know, the, the writings so, such as Langston Hughes, people who have been crushed. But when we are crushed, what comes from us is Toni Morrison, is the Langston Hughes, the, the poetry. And, 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 you know, it's, it's the beloved. And this is the, the thing in which when we are crushed, and this is something that, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, he talks about the, the, the sorrow songs in his book, The Souls of Black Folks. And he said, he said this tradition, the, the songs that comes from the, 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 the Negro, the spirituals, is one of the greatest gifts America has to give to the world. Mm. Powerful stuff there. And, and so when you're thinking about what the love looks like, the, the love looks like struggle. The love looks like confrontation. But it's a, 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 and so the love is action. Love is resisting, but it's not resisting for your own sake. It's resisting because you have a vision of a greater good that includes other people. In, it includes those people that are resisting you and trying to kill you, that I'm trying to get you to see a vision that is not just the erasure of you so that I can be, you know, um, someone who's on top. It's, it's a vision that includes all of us. Mm-hmm. And that is something in which is really captured by, uh, and I love the the we just come out we just come from we just had the um, the Easter, and in my reading of the the Gospels, I, I love the difference between I read the synop 
synoptic gospels and their narrative. And when I read the, when I read the Johannine tradition, I, I love John's approach because in, in the others, there seems to be a rush to the resurrection. You know, we want, we want to get the crucifixion over, get the suffering over, and then the resurrection. But in the Johannine approach, it, it's not the, the crescendo, the high point, it's not the resurrection, but the crucifixion. It's, it's on the cross that Jesus try, cries out in the Johannine narrative that it is finished. It's in the cross that Jesus reigns, it, 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 not just in the resurrection, but Christ is reigning on the cross. And, and so this, this idea of victory and triumph in the midst of suffering is something that we've learned. And I think because of the history of black people in, in the world, in fact, and particularly in the transatlantic world, it's something that we are able to teach the world more than anybody else. This sense of love and suffering together. And it comes through our poetry. It comes through our songs it comes through, you know, all what we do, you know, our gospel music, that you will see suffering, you will see love, suffering and love, suffering and love. Because if I just get, if I just suffer and focus on my suffering, I'm going to get bitter. I'm going to get resentful. I'm going to get in the sense that I'm going to lose my way. But as long as I can maintain the love, I can keep on moving. And, and it's that dance between love and justice that Jesus exemplifies and that we need to constantly go back to in order to not lose our way. Oh, excellent. Dr. Excellent. Clark, you know, um, one of the uh, secular uh, framings of that type of that love that you're speaking of is when people say that black folks have soul. Right. They That's don't right. understand, but they're really, they're really saying what you said. Yeah, uh, that's right. Just, just one picture here. When... Um, uh, we were in a campaign uh, some years back, and Jim Bevel was uh, was over in Mississippi training some people for a nonviolent uh, protest. And the Ku Klux Klan um, uh, came in mass and took him out on a highway and and beat him terribly and had planned to kill him. And as as they beat him, um, and this came from Jim and, and from Lafayette, but but primarily from Jim, he said that as they beat him. Uh, he began to pray, and he prayed for uh, for all of the people that were there. He prayed for them. He prayed that their children would not be affected by the legacy of the hatred. He prayed that that they would have a life that would would one day um, wow. reflect the love that they uh, have for each other and should have had for him, and that he has for them. And then one by one, they began to drop their clubs and they drop their their uh, their instrument their implements and walk away until finally Jim was left out on the highway basically alone. Wow! Um, and Mississippi highways are very very dark. <laughs> very much for life. Very dark. And, and it was it was Bernard and and the rest of the crew who came and got him off the off the highway and took him to the hospital. So he demonstrated exactly what you just said. Yeah, I mean that's 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 deep right there. You yeah. know. Um, Love has to reach beyond, love is existential. Love has to reach beyond the now, you know, and, and, and it's, it's something that um, we, we, we need to revisit love as a church and just spend time um, because we've, we've made love soft. We've made mm -hmm. love a panacea, a go-to whenever there is conflict in the black community and and it's 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 sad that we've done this uh, and because if we are going to be christians and christian scholars are, are, are meant to and this is why i love bonhoeffer you know it comes through our, our writings uh, okay, well, so it's easy for me to become a black theologian but not not a christian theologian i'm a black political theologian i'm a christian Mm -hmm. It's easy for me to be a prophet, but I'm a Christian. I mean, do, do I spend time with God? Do you pray and, and, and want God to come through your writing? And, and I think to some extent, this, this sense in which academia has become some second, even, even when it comes to uh, the church and scholarship and the seminary, has become some secular 
um, enterprise. That, that in the same way that a preacher is, is pouring over his sermon and, and wanting to preach and speak, that, that our writings become abstract and weak and, and it doesn't demonstrate a deep, and, and this, you know, Mark Knowles talks about the, the scandal of the evangelical mind. And that's what he was talking about. He said, how on earth could, 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 could Jim Crow and all these things happen? And, and, and the same evangelical mind didn't kick in to deal with this in the public space. Mm-hmm. He said, what happened to us? That we are not able to, artic- and, 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 and God knows what he would think, what happened today, what's happening now. That the, the evangelical minds were able, people like, you know, in, even in our modern times, John Stott and, and many others were able to engage. Well, that's why even um, John Wesley had a track on slavery, because when you're engaging in scripture, you can't let these things go by. Yes. And, and, and it's critical thinking that allows us to begin to have a prophetic voice. And, and, and where are the evangelical voices? Where are the evangelical scholars? When we see these things happening, happening in society, it's those who are engaging history, tradition, and scripture that are going to speak and bring balance in public spaces. Mm-hmm. And it's because evangelicalism has become, and when I'm thinking about evangelicalism, I'm not just speaking about whites. Because when I, when I read in history, this sense of going back to the Great Awakening and, and looking, at to, looking at many of the people like David Walker, Many others who way back in the in you know in, in the in the eighteen hundreds were speaking from scripture. They were black folks. Um, they were black evangelicals. There's a strong when I say black evangelicals, people who was who, who was speaking and proclaiming a Bible centered gospel. David Walker stood up in, a, in, in the marketplace and proclaimed, how can you be Christian and at the same time and um, be, lynch, be, be, be a slave owner? He was lynched not too long after. And there are many others who were individuals who proclaimed. And I think it was the critical engagement of scripture that allowed us to, to speak into the public spaces. And now because there's a dearth of, of critical thinking from a biblical perspective, um, and there's a shallowness in this, it's easy for anyone with any kind of agenda to, to, to um, co-opt us and we're running around, you know, following these shallow ideas is a sad day for evangelicalism. Well, Dr. Clark, how about uh, uh, list, he- hearing from your friend, Elaine, <laughs> the uh, Old Testament scholar, the biblicist, uh, she has to go early in our program because- Oh, her- sure, yes. But I want her to jump in and say something with you. Hi, Dr. Clark, it's so good to see you here. Mm-hmm. Um, So the question I have, um, and I've been pondering this while you've been talking, most of the people, not everyone, but most of the people that I interact with are master compartmentalizers. So I can love this person. I can love this situation while hating this person and hating this situation which is very interesting to me because as you said, you know, when we're talking about the Old Testament, when we're talking about chesed, we're talking about all encompassing love Mm. that is not compartmentalized, that addresses what is good and what is evil and continues to love and continues to love and continues to love. So for people who come from, Um, backgrounds where it's easier, where it's more natural to compartmentalize. Um, What can we do? How can we help people move from such deep compartmentalization to all encompassing love? Mm. You know, one of the things that, and this is, this is important, I think, and this is why the Old Testament non, um, ideas of love is a go-to place for me, because um, 
it, it really allows us to uh, whole testament is, is not is not the greek they don't have the kind of greek dichotomization and trichotomization they're not interested in body soul and spirit it, 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 it's one bundle of love it, yes. it's it's mixed in there when god says i love you um he's putting ever it's, it's just like my, when my mother used to cook you know she used to put all kinds of things together in there she didn't just put the, things on the side and this is, and you can choose on the table this wasn't like when you go to a chinese restaurant or what you can choose like buffet no no she put it together uh, and what she put together is it's it's something that when you taste it you wouldn't believe it you know and i and i think for those people who and it's easy to compartmentalize there's nothing wrong with loving yourself and loving your race there's nothing wrong with that. Every race, every group, every ethnic group have something to be ashamed of and things to admire. And we mustn't, if you can't, and I, and I love the idea that the Bible says that you must love God as you love yourself. Now, it, it, unless, unless Caucasian, African, unless we learn to love ourselves, we can't love God. And we can't know we can't love ourselves unless we know God. And so loving ourselves is important. But once we once we understand ourselves and we we are we are comfortable in ourselves, and being comfortable in ourselves can only be understood fully when we are at ease and know that we are loved by God uh, and 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 we are affirmed by God. And and I think once we have that. It gives us the courage, because this is the other point. To love, you need courage. And the courage that, that allows you, and it's hard to have courage unless you are, you are anchored. Um, it's good that when you're anchored in your family, you're anchored in your church, you're anchored in your tradition, you're anchored in your history, um, it gives you the courage to go out to share. And I think once we, we have those things in place, then we can begin to reach out to others. We can begin to not to deny ourselves and try to be ashamed of ourselves, but, but, but engage others and be vulnerable, be open, learn. Um, and I think one of the challenges of the European Anglo world is because of this enlightenment, global colonized arrogance it, it, it historically bears down on us and, and that it doesn't allow, it doesn't, if we're not careful, it doesn't allow other spaces to breathe. Mm. And I think that what we need to tell people is go on, go and find people of difference and, and sit and learn and eat and share and understand and share where you come from, share your stories. And, and, and once we begin to do that, walls will start coming down because we have to do this not just from an ideological point of view, but it's going to be a painstaking daily personal love. And when we begin to do that, we're going to see changes in society that cannot be changed by policies, that cannot be changed. By, and we need to make sure that we have policies and laws, right, to ensure that people are protected. But ultimately, it's not going to be laws and policies. It's going to be one's hearts. And our hearts can only be changed one heart at a time. And, and communities that we have, have to, we have to seek to have communities that are, are, are diverse. And even if they're not diverse, because there are many traditions that they, because of geography, right, that, that things aren't, if you're in a highly white area or black area, or there's a particular tradition in the church, fine, Churches can be of a certain tradition, but make it an effort for individuals in your work, in your school, in your wherever you are, come out of your comfort zone. And when you see an Asian person from Korea, what does that mean? Go out your comfort. And I think what we should tell people is that the way to, to deal with this compartment, compartmentalization is to begin to imbibe and to in, and to take the courage to to learn and to travel and to eat and and, and to make real relationships with people and and, not, and I mean this this is I said when you say when you say to yourself I'm going to not organically I'm going to go out of my way and make a friend who's different from me mm -hmm. I'm going to do something 
to challenge myself. I'm going to go out my way. And that could be a Muslim. It could be anyone. And I think once we begin to do that, we can begin to make some And these are the type of things that need to be preached from our pulpit. We need to be doing that in our writing, encouraging people to have the courage to reach out to other people. Hmm. And I think that's what we're trying to do on this program as well, Dr. Clark. <laughs> but, you know, there's a person, as I look at my screen, I'm looking at a person to my left, your right, uh, Dr. Lois is there and I want her to jump in because uh, I think she's very special to you even as well, Dr. Clark, and she might have a word she wants to share as well. Well, I so appreciate you, uh, Clifton, and the work that you do on so many fronts and uh, being able to work with you together on uh, in the Pente Pentecostal Justice Coalition and uh, the manifesto that we're working on. That's uh, whoever's listening to this can be praying for us because we've got a, a great group of, of <laughs> diverse people uh, working on that, including uh, Elaine. And, um, and uh, just, um, I appreciate having been able to work, uh, edit this book for you and uh, be a part of, of that story. Um, I don't know if at the beginning of the uh, program, we mentioned the title of the book, but uh, it's Love Remedy. Good. I was hoping that you had it right there. Um, and I noticed that uh, uh, Dr. Golfin did post your link, uh, Clifton, on the, uh, on the Facebook Live page. Um, I had two questions. One is on behalf of our brother, Rob, who needed to leave. Um, and then just uh, my question would be if in maybe our, our remaining moments, you can deal with the Ahava uh, mm -hmm. definition of love, uh, which you deal with in the book Hesed and Ahava. Um, but but um, Rob's question was, uh, how does Paul's admonition, love hopes all things and believes all things, factor into the context of racism. So if you could address that, uh, he'd, he'd appreciate that. And then maybe we can uh, have time to wrap up with the other question that I had. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think in the book, I, I spend some time and particularly looking at um, Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13, I think it is. Um, you know, loves, believes, love hopes, and um, and this is the great thing about love, especially as you mentioned the Hava aspect. Um, and I think that um, without hope, it's very difficult to love. Um, and when Paul is is dealing with, and, it's, and I love this because we see we see Paul the Greek and Paul the Paul the person influenced by Greek ideas and Paul, the Jewish individual um, coming together. We see that the, the, the sort of um, rabbinic tradition, this idea of one, there's compartmentalization in, in love and, and all these different things, but he puts it together uh, and then he summarizes. You know, if I, if I, it, it, you know, there's so much things he, can, he talks about in, in, in this, what love is. Um, but at the end of the day, he talks about the greatest of these. You know, when he talks about faith, hope, charity, the greatest of these is love. And so I, I would say that love is the, um, it, love is the vehicle. Um, and, and hope, as, when I think about hope, is the aspect of love that gives, love is, hope is the telescope. Hope is the GPS. It locates where we're, where we're going. And love is the staying power. It's the vehicle that we're driving in to get there. And, and the hope tells us where we are going to. So we're not, we're not just moving around. Hope as a destination. And I think once we have that destination, and this is something that in our contemporary situation, we often hear people fighting and, not, and struggling and resisting. And when you're thinking that, even when you think about Black Lives Matter, you're thinking about all kinds of evangelical groups, and you think about groups that are concerned about diversity and all, the, all these groups are raising concern, but nobody's talking about a destination. Where are we going, right? I mean, it's, it's a sense in which, what is the vision that includes all of us? 
And I think hope is, it, it paints the picture that Martin Luther King talked about. It paints the picture of what the vision is. And everyone who's a leader understands that you have a method and you also have a vision. Your method says that, look, this is, you know, your method, you know, I'm going to do this through love, right? Your, your method talks about how we are going to do it. But your vision tells you what we want to become, where are we going? And I think looking at the now and, 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 and the future, the, the, keeping those in, in play is, is, is important. Um, and so love is what we do. Love is how we act in the now. Love is the thing that we gives us perspective in doing things. But hope says this is why we're doing it. And this is why you, what we need to keep in perspective that one day we, we are going to see a time when black people, white people, people who are Asian and whatever from all parts of the world shall be together in Christ. We shall get back to the Garden of Eden. We shall get to the point where the redemptive love of God is going to be so inclusive, right? And so that, and we, we are keeping that in play. And that is the hope. And I think we don't hear much, we don't hear too much about that. We don't hear much about why are we struggling? Where are we going? And this is one of the things about Martin Luther King was able to do. He was able to have a vision of, of the destination of love. One day, my, my, my little, you know, my, my black children shall walk hand in hand with little white boys and little black boys. He, he's talking about a vision. And, and even though critical race theory would say that, well, I mean, this ain't going to work because the foundation in which we are building this on is flawed. This foundation is flawed. We're still going to need love to do it. You know, so a lot of the critical race theory, which would say that even the basis of what King is hoping for in terms of his, his vision of inclusivity and reconciliation will never be realized because the very the basis is that it's based upon the premise in terms of the society, in terms of the, the history and the economy and the politics in which we're trying to make, work this out is flawed. Um, still, love is going to be needed because even if the foundation, so go ahead. Your, your picture of the cross is so perfect here because of the cross being the epitome of love. We also have the, we also have the scripture where it says, Jesus, but for the joy set before him, you know, yes. that hope that it, the love didn't, it's, it's uh, embodied in the cross, but it doesn't end in the cross. It, that, that lo love hopes all things goes beyond right. the cross to somehow see us sitting here today, having this conversation, which is right. No, absolutely. <laughs> totally agree. Uh, I think with, with, with your Hahava, um, you know, the way I look at it is, is, when I think about chesed, chesed is commitment. Chesed said, look, I'm not going to let you go. Chesed is that Naomi and Ruth said, look, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to stay with you. Chesed mm -hmm. um, is the man who, whose wife is, uh, my, my, and I talk about my own Old Testament professor, who I, I saw his wife um, for many years. She had Parkinson's disease. And, and for years, she was unresponsive. And that man pushed that woman around. He talked, he laughed, and he, I watched him. And he, he, John Gordon Gay, I'm talking about, he was at, at St. John's in England. And I was, I was a young student, undergraduate. Um, and, and, you know, we ended up at Fuller. And I watched him as that man loved um, one way. Nothing received, many years didn't receive nothing back. Hesed is about com a commitment, loyalty. Stay in power. However, it is it, it, is is something more. It's is the love and kindness. Ahava, for me anyway, when I read about it, it's it 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 is that it talks about the attitude that I'm going to bring into this love. Um, and you can help me, um, Lois, in this. But um, it it it's it's the it's the joy. Ahava also. It's the singing. 
Ahaz, Ahava is a romancing. It, Ahava is not, I'm the guy who, I'm, I'm the man in the house who I bring, I work hard and I, I bring in the bacon or the rest of it. Ahava is the flowers, baby. <laughs> Ahava <laughs> says it's a dance that I'm going through it, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I'm singing and I'm dancing. Uh, and and, and it's, the, it's the loving kindness of the Lord. Look at that word kindness i'm i'm going to not just be i'm not going to just love you but i'm going to be kind i'm going to be romancing and and it's wonderful that when we talk about the loving kindness think about that word kindness my attitude is going to be kind and loving it's that part that we uh, where we need together. So we need the chesed that is, a, is the stay in love, the love and kindness. But the however, we need that too because it's a song. Who wants just commitment? A man is staying with you, a woman is staying with you all these years, but miserable, not that it's miserable, but you know, it's just commitment. But you don't hear the song. You don't hear the poetry. You don't hear the love, the whispers into the ears. I love you. And, and you look fantastic. It's those two things that you oh, need wow. together. Mm. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, we're, we're, that's, that brings up Tina Turner to me again. What's love got to do with it? Come on, girl. Listen, uh, Dr. Shank is back with us from the Dietrich Bonhoeffer talking to the Martin Luther King, and he might want to say something with you too, Clifton, this, this morning. All right. Yeah, I'm so sorry I had to duck out to do a quick uh, media hit, as they call it. But fortunately, it was short because I wanted to get back to hear you, Dr. Clark, and can't wait to read uh, the book. And I had posed the question I did for a reason, because just what you spoke of now, this kindness, this generosity that goes with love, and particularly divine love, and I think of the epitome of it as, you know, a central verse, at least for most Bible-believing Christians, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the entirety of the world, every inhabitant of it, without limitation. You know, as I get older, I kind of become a quasi-Calvinist, but I can't quite get there on election <laughs> because it just seems to me, um, yeah, maybe... Uh, uh, Dr. Golfin and I would have a, a spirited debate on that one. I don't know. But um, in any case, you know, it seems to me that generosity, that giving is an essential part of divine love and certainly the love we are to have for one another. And yet we modulate mm. our love. We give and we take. We are generous in one moment and very selfish right in another moment and we modulate this and it gets to the racism question for me and i'll shut up with this that in in the world i inhabit i i i kind of straddle two worlds right and left liberal progressive versus conservative traditional mm. i'm in as many liberal churches if you will as i am in conservative churches and each side is never generous towards the other. They will mm. assume the worst right. about each other. And instead of generously and in kindness, you know, I think the reason I structured the question that I did about Paul, love hopes all things, yes. believes all things. Mm. So I'm going to believe the best right. of you before you'll, you'll have to prove me wrong. And most, mm. and some people will. Mm you know but so that's that's kind of what was behind it and i wonder your mm. thoughts about yeah how, I love it. where it intersects with race and yeah race, I, I, yeah I, yeah it, it, it's at the core but let me tell you why racism is about prejudice with power you know everybody's prejudiced you, you can say I, I don't like people with bold heads okay <laughs> now that we all know that we can we can have that um that our preferences, um, we don't like people with white beards, you know, like um, our brother Gayton. <laughs> but <laughs> now when, when I begin to legislate and I begin to 
to empower my hatred, my preference, then that's a whole different level. And I think to some extent what you're saying here, it's about when you're talking about this idea of, of race ethnocentricity, this sense of protectionism, uh, and it comes out of the place of fear, it comes from a place of, of, of deep um, egotistical, and, and in, in a sense, it comes from a vulnerability of death that you're afraid that you're going to be annihilated. Um, and I think that um, what love does, love, love reaches out, it, it's, it, it's vulnerable. Um, and I think that when we understand that and, when, and how it intersects with race is, is that we need to be, to be able to see people who are different. And this is the, the, the history of racism. When we, think in the, when we think about how it started, right? It was a sense in which individuals, not modern racism, going back to Linearius and all of those uh, mod, Marsden who created these sort of theories that talked about black people of physiological inferior, intellectual craniology, then people's brain sizes, all these type of things, right? It's, it's to say, we are going to construct an, a way in which we can look on people and say that they are, they are inferior. Um, and I think that the, what, what, you're, what you're driving out there is that when we, when we love, we, we, we need to look at people and look at the, and see the best, even when you're in your worst. The Bible says that, that while we were yet sinners, I love that, while we were yet sinners, while we were wretched and decrepit, while we, while we were in the situation, Christ died for us. Mm-hmm. And you know why? And, and this is what I have to do. I have to see the picketing, torch-lighting white supremacists and look beyond that and see something better. I have to look beyond that and see that I see you differently. I see a potential in you to be better than what you are. And that, that changes the way I engage with you. Because my engagement with you is not to annihilate you, to, it's not to beat you down, but it is to, it's to draw out the better in you. And I'll tell you something else. If I keep pressing, if I stay with you, if I keep loving, it's gonna, it's gonna, it, I believe it's going to come out for most people. It will come out. Mm. Because your fear, your wall will break down. And I, and I think that in our engagement with each other, the reason why I have to maintain love and kindness is that I believe that the, the God, God's spark is in you. It may be flickering. It, 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 may, it may be at a low ebb. You know, it may be in, in, using the old gas cooker. It may be on one, but it's there. And I think that I have to speak to you even though I abhor what you do, you, what you say, and, and, and I have to still believe that there's good in you. And I think that that is what Paul is talking about, that love is kind, uh, and that racism says, not just that I don't see anything good, is that I don't need to see anything good in you because you're not my equal. Mm-hmm. I don't need to. And it's interesting, the first thing that they wanted to do is to say that if you are Christian in, during the time of slavery, mm-hmm. you don't, one, you don't have a soul. So therefore, I don't need to look at you in the way that God as God cre- God's creation. And secondly, um, even if you have a soul that when you are saved, it makes no ontological difference in, you, in, in and certainly makes no practical difference in your life. And I think... You know, if we can, and this is the point, you know, um, Rob, we have to be able to look at people, and this is a Christian thing, and and, and this is what um, most of the Wolf talks about, living um, redemptively, and, and having redemptive memory, Wolf's talk about. He says that I'm looking at you, 
but I'm seeing you through the cross. I'm seeing that all what you're doing is a part of what Jesus died for. Your angst, your racism, your bitterness, you know, all of what you're doing is what Jesus died for. And so I'm not just seeing, I'm seeing you redemptively because I can also see you that Christ died for the very things that you are putting putting forward to me. So when I see you redemptively, I can see that you also can find Christ, find good. And I think that that redemptive memory that um, when I when I look at people, in, you know, who are, who are different from me, I also see myself that I was a decrepit sinner. Christ loved me when I was when, when I was all as abhorrent as you are to me. Jesus loved me. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing you through the redemptive love of Christ who saw me. Mm-hmm. And that gives meaning to the way I engage with you. I'm still going to resist you but I'm resisting you in a way because I'm, I'm struggling you and I'm seeing and I'm believing that you can become better. And I don't want you to die. I don't want you to become annihilated. I want you to experience a resurrection. That's what I'm resisting. And that's why I'm, 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 I'm facing. And so I think that that is at the heart of, of a Christian struggle. A Christian struggle is not, it's not replacing the oppressor with a different oppressor. A, a Christian uh, made of struggle is removing oppression altogether and replacing it with love. Yes. Brother, Brother Clifton, um, before we roll out, and I know we're running out of time, and 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 uh, but this is going to push the button in just a moment. But but uh, if if we go back to the principle of first mention, the first time we see love uh, in in the formal term is in Genesis twenty two and two, and that's where, uh, if you recall. Uh, God told uh, told uh, Abraham to take his son and and, uh, and and do what he was supposed to do with him, and uh, and it just seemed it was interesting to me that it was not love between uh, people uh, that uh, God was impressed at least impressed me with. It He said, "Take now your son for your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Arai. You love him, but go and sacrifice him." Mm. So. I, 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 I'm trying to wrap my, my head around. If you remember, uh, the first time you see it in, um, in, in the New Testament is basically when Jesus, when, when the word says in John 3.16, which you made reference to earlier, that uh, for God so loved the world. And, and in both instances, it seems to be about sacrificing. So uh, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm thinking about Soren Kierkegaard. And he has, a, I mean, and I'll refer you to him. Oh my gosh, when 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 Kierkegaard deals with that text um and talk and he, he talks about this idea of responding what who do you respond to? Mm-hmm. Um it's Abraham, you got you got the law of the land which says that you know it's illegal to kill, but then you got God who's telling you to do something. And he talks about this idea. Um, I forgot the name of the, the book, but it, um, but he talks about this, and, it, and he uses the Abraham narrative um, to talk about the level of commitment that we have. And and he's saying that, uh, and it comes down onto the point that those who uh, that Abraham was right to make his commitment to God and to follow through, um, but be, but 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 to also to be willing to pay the consequences because ultimately if god tells you to do something um that's the most important thing and, and i think that struggle between um what god tells us to do uh, um and, and 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 it goes against everything that may be in society may be in uh, what god is calling us to a commitment to him first and is testing that commitment and that our loyalty must ultimately be to God's mission. And that's what God is doing. God is saying, look, I want to, if I get your attention, if I can get you to, 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 to love me above anything else, then I can change the world through you. Um, but, but you've got to love me first. It's going back to, to the Shema, we have to love God first. And I think um, that is the key. That is the key for all of us, that the love of God 
and the, and and the motivation and the vision that God called her. That's what we see through Abraham. We see a commitment to God, even though it meant going against everything in the society, going against his own, you know, his, his only son. It, it, that is, I'm gonna I'm gonna be so committed to God that it could be to my detriment. It could be towards, you know, you know, imprisonment, everything else. But I'm going to be committed to God. That kind of commitment to God is what we need because ultimately that's going to bring us back on, on track. But that, that's a great narrative. And, and I would urge you, if you aren't ready, to look at Soren Kierkegaard's own in, engagement with, with God asking Abraham to do the unthinkable. You know, so that's right. Well, love remedy, yeah. Dr. Clark. You've written a very, mm -hmm. very uh, wonderful book, very insightful. The love <laughs> remedy, and God is love, God is love, and that you know, our whole thought, his whole thought is reconciliation. And we've always said that if you're not, if your goal is not to be reconciled. You're running on the wrong track altogether as a Christian. Our goal is to reconcile. So we appreciate you coming today, Dr. Clark. And we believe that you, you. you've contributed to all of our growth and our struggle and kept us and steered us to the right track that we don't get off track, stay on the right path. It's piety and protest in balance. We're so glad for you being with us today. And, 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 I'm, and it's a pleasure for me to work with you on a regular basis. So I'm so glad uh, that Lois brought us all together for sure. And uh, I think we've run out of time for today. And mm -hmm. uh, boy, I'll tell you, we could talk for another whole hour with you, Dr. Clark, that's for sure. You need to bring him back for another show, man. <laughs> well, I was going to talk to him afterwards, but you know, uh, you know, we, we, we'll see. <laughs> I didn't want to put him on the spot right on the show. So anyhow, but uh, yes, and I believe uh, uh, Dr. Shank would have a lot of more questions for you as well. And we all know that Bishop Sterling has been in it already. He's still in it. He's still floating right now. And uh, this has been so good. And this is what we need to hear. You're absolutely right. Love is the remedy. And we didn't get to deal with the God's impassibility and how it's tied into this concept of love, which would have been so critical in my understanding. But nevertheless, your book is a great read. So we commend it to everybody that we should read that book and uh, let the love of God be shed abroad in all of our hearts. And uh, his goal is to reconcile the whole world unto, and he's made us ambassadors of reconciliation, pleading, imploring others to come into this kingdom. So we're grateful to all of you who've listened to the show today and to hear Dr. Clark share with us the love remedy for sure. And we're just going to keep promoting this. And uh, we're just believing God that in this world, we're going to see the manifestation of God through Christ by his Holy Spirit to empower the whole church to be a loving church in these last days. As the world becomes more wicked, the church ought to become more loving through the power of Almighty God. And so we're grateful uh, that God is love, not just the adjective of loving God, but a noun, God is love. And so we're grateful today for you, Dr. Clark, taking the time all the way from California this early in the morning to be with us. You've spoken the words of eternal life. So I say to our closing audience, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each one of you and give you shalom. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen, amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, guys. Thank you for the invitation. God bless you, Dr. Amen. Clark. Thank you. Everyone, God bless you. I love you all. Love you all. Love is...